chef. Uh, so <laughs> famous Japanese rotisserie, just like Benihana. center stage we have Tony's special. This hamburger has been cooking for 35 minutes now. It has no salt, no garlic, nothing of that sort. It's been turned over 15 times and it's just about ready to be eaten or otherwise disposed of. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Hooray! Hooray! I don't know whether I should break this news on educational TV or not, but Julie and I just found out this morning that Jane is pregnant again. <laughs> and not only pregnant, but with sophisticated techniques we've discovered that there are triplets. <laughs> And finally, the going away, unfortunately, we're saying au reservoir to Chris and Tony and family. And they're heading for Dallas, which is down near LA, right? Right. Yeah. 
fact, we have to go to LA to get there on the way. All right. I've been to Dallas several times, and Dallas is kind of a combination of uh, Winnemucca and Barstow and Oakland, but still a very nice place. And we wish Chris and Tony all the very best down there, and we hope they're going to come back often. We have a little going away <laughs> present for Chris. Uh, if, uh -oh. if Tony would, uh, or Julie would bring that over, we'll record this for posterity. Julie bought this at a very expensive shop on her last trip to New York. I think you can see Saks Fifth Avenue or some such thing on there. Oh, yeah. good. That's and we would like to make the presentation to Chris. Oh my gosh. Gosh. <laughs> What is it, guys? This could be dangerous. Should I sit down in the seat? <laughs> hey, I ought to take over here. <laughs> hey, guys. Look at that. <laughs> Do you remember that? Hello, Ranger. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> hey, you know what? Guess what? Do you think it fits you? Let's come try it. It fits me. You want to try it on you? Okay, here. You got to try it like that. <laughs> okay, anybody who wants to try it on them, they got to sit on Grandpa's lap to do it, okay? Okay? Well, there is Sweetie on center stage, trying on Chris's hat. Well, I was going to make another final comment about Dallas, what we hear about things down there from way off here, far away. We don't hear too much. We know there used to be a lot of cowboys and a lot of oil men down there. And the cowboys are no longer there, they're all running seafood restaurants. And we've heard a rumor, we don't know anything about, that most of the oil men are working as waiters in those seafood <laughs> restaurants. Uh, but uh, should we go on to a different subject? Yes. <laughs> uh, how about a story about when I was eight years old? Whoa, he was yeah. never eight years old. <laughs> don't let him no. do it like Impossible. No way. No way. Impossible. <laughs> No way. Uh, no impossible. Way, no, uh, way. no way. No way? Okay. Well, when I was eight years old, I was a little boy, but, you know, so eight big. A little eight boy, eight yeah, eight right. Eight and eight my eight dad eight said, eight well, I was never that little boy? No. Yeah. Okay, so my dad said, uh, that he was going to take me on a trip across the ocean in a big ocean liner, a steamer. Somebody calls them steamers here. So we went to Scotland on a steamer, and that took, from Canada, that took about uh, 10 days, as I recall. I don't remember too much being only eight years old. We had a nice vacation there. And then what happened was not expected, and they had what they call a general strike, and everybody stopped working and we had to get back to the ship uh, and by midnight on such and such a date or my this was during the depression and my dad would lose a job which was a very important thing in those days so but there was nobody working and we had there was no taxis there was no buses And how do you imagine we could possibly get back to the ship, which was miles away in a huge city? There was no horses, no dogs. We were in very serious trouble. Plus, not only that, but there are thousands of men roaming the streets, rioting, throwing stones, turning over buses, streetcars and nobody was going out in the streets at all except for them. But my dad was determined that he had to get back to work, so he found somebody with a small pickup truck with an open back that, who said he would take us down to the dock at about three o'clock in the morning. 
And so we were all ready at about one o'clock in the morning and we were worried that all these men in the streets would stop us. And we had to go through big gates, big steel gates into the Navy Yard. And the Navy was protecting the ship on the other side. And on this side were all these mobs of men that were very mad at everybody. So at three o'clock in the morning, away we went and the streets were deserted. But when we got down near the Navy Yard, here we saw thousands of men massed in front of the gates. And the driver wanted to turn around and go back right away. And my dad leaned over, grabbed the wheel, put his foot on the gas and headed straight for the gate and the crowd. Sounds a little like my dad. <laughs> and he passed me a uh, big wrench about this long and in those days there weren't any windows on cars so the, my window was wide open. And he said, you hit anybody that tries to get in our car. So here I was, eight years old, and a thousand men, and we were heading straight for them. I was pitch black, and all of a sudden they were jumping all over the car, arms were coming in like this, and I was whacking away with my <laughs> big wrench, <laughs> and uh, they, were, they threw all our trunks and things off the back of the pickup truck. And, but my dad still had his foot on the gas and we went right up to the big steel gates and the Navy could see us coming and they opened the gates at the last minute and we just had enough speed to go through those gates and they slammed them behind and we were all set to go on the big ship back to Canada. Yeah. Happy, happy ending. <laughs> Hmm? True story. Yeah. Yeah. True story. Right. You got the first question. How much guys did you knock out when you were hitting them with the big wrench? Oh, I heard lots of shrieks of pain. <laughs> and I think probably about 16 or 18, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh -huh. Did you kill some? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> 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 I don't think so. That was, you know, so far back that uh, it's almost before recorded history. What year was this? Let's see, that was about... Uh, 1925. 1925, six, somewhere in there. Okay, what's the next story, Grandpa? What's the next story? I want to hear the story about... I think we ought to have a story about... Uh, some story. Uh, How about the Navy? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the Navy? What, uh, yeah, when you're in the Navy, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, a good one? Yeah. Well, Nick's a big uh, super fan for uh, Top Gun, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Top Gun. Okay, well, in the Navy, I was on two types of ships. One was an aircraft carrier, and I went to see Top Gun, too, and I was hoping to see lots of aircraft carrier scenes. Unfortunately, there weren't very many, uh, very few, if any. But uh, I was about two years on a destroyer and two years on an aircraft carrier. And the two years on the destroyer was in the North Atlantic, around Greenland and Iceland, and all up that way. And we seldom saw the sun. And I was an engineer officer. And one day, and it was very foggy and cold, and one day we were going along in the fog, and we couldn't see our hand in front of our face, and all of a sudden here was a German U-boat right in front of us on the surface with torpedoes and all that. And immediately he had some men on the top. Immediately he started to fire on us, and we fired back on him, and we started going in circles. He had a smaller, he could turn in a smaller circle than we could. So we were going around like a cat and a dog in circles. 
He was in the center. He was shooting like mad at us, and we were shooting at him. But he had better guns in those days, so he started some fires on our ship, and we started to burn. And things were looking pretty bad. When finally he made one, we and also our guns, our big guns, were not designed to depress far enough down so we could shoot at him. He was too close to us. We could only shoot over him. And things were looking worse and worse. And then he made one slight mistake. And our captain was able to change course and we rammed him. He didn't sink, but he was in bad shape and he gave up and all the crew came to our ship except for a few that were killed. And then, but he sank his submarine and we, we captured all the crew who were all big bad Germans except for one who was a Canadian that happened to be over in Germany visiting his parents when the uh, war had started and he was kept in Germany and he, had, and he was made to go in the Navy. So he was very glad to see us. And that was another happy ending. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to hear any more? Are they done? More! More! more. 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 Yeah. How, about when, uh, how about when Chris was a little boy? Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. 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 I think that would be a good one. All right. Everybody seems to want that, except the camera person. Well, uh, years ago when Chris was a very little boy, can you imagine Chris being a little boy? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. 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 Nobody can imagine me being a little boy, but they can imagine Chris being a little boy. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. That's because uh, I act like. Yeah. I act like one more often. <laughs> Uh, Chris was about 12, and Jane was about 15, 14. And Julie and I decided to sail on our old sailboat, the 38-foot Nally, the trusty sailboat from San Francisco down all the way down to the Mexican border. And everybody did have a good trip. We sailed down to Half Moon Bay and Monterey and such places. Finally, we got down to Santa Cruz Island, which is off the California coast. And we anchored there one evening in a big bay. And there was nothing but Pacific Ocean for thousands of miles, as far as you could see, except for that one island. And Chris said, I want to go fishing. So I said, well, this is very dangerous to go fishing, Chris. You know, here you could drift away forever. We'd never see you again. We had a little plastic dinghy, and he wanted to go in that plastic dinghy. And it was quite windy. So... Oh, he, not this story. <laughs> <laughs> this brings back terrible memories. <laughs> this is one of the most famous stories. <laughs> So Chris kept pleading and pleading, and uh, we're so good-natured that uh, we decided, well, we'll let him go fishing. But we warned him that there's a big line of seaweed just behind us out towards the ocean. And for heaven's sakes, not to go beyond that, because he'd be in deep trouble. And so he's promised that he wouldn't go beyond the seaweed. So we sat in the ship and Julie was getting dinner ready and I was watching Chris now and then and he was fishing and fishing and going further and further away and pretty soon he was in the middle of the seaweed and then I could tell that he was going to the outside of the seaweed and things were looking a little bit a little bit uh, scary for Chris 
and we signaled him to come back and he said, well, uh, you know, in a little bit. He wanted to catch a fish and uh, he wanted to know when dinner was and we said, well, not for a bit. And so he said, well, I won't be back for a while. So then we saw him getting into trouble and his boat was drifting out on the very edge of the seaweed and he dropped his fishing rod and he was hanging on to the seaweed for dear life and the wind was blowing and the South Pole was his next stop if he <laughs> got loose from there. <laughs> and so uh, we waved to him to come back but he was so busy holding on to the seaweed he couldn't let go with one hand to do anything and he just hung on and hung on for dear life and I got the binoculars out and I looked and studied his face and he was really scared, I can tell you that. Really scared. <laughs> and, uh, so I said to Julie, well, this will teach him a good lesson, you know, to pay attention to his parents. And we'll just let him stay there for a while. And Julie said, no, you don't do that. You go out and get him right away. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, in a few minutes. She said, you go and get him right away. <laughs> so I had to go and pull up the anchor and start the engine and do well, all that. Uh, so yeah. That's why I'm here today, because That's she right. said, you got to go get him right away. going <laughs> 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 to be in Tokyo. <laughs> you wouldn't have to worry about this camera, man. <laughs> so we had to go chugging through the seaweed and stop dinner and everything. <laughs> and we had to rescue that boy, that you know, boy wouldn't pay any attention to his parents and we had to rescue him from the seaweed and the wind, haul him on board and he said he'd never do anything like that again. From then on he'd listen to his parents and do as they said. Another happy ending. <laughs> I can tell you one little story about uh, that's more or less a parallel to the one we just heard. Uh, in this case, uh, I wasn't paying too much attention. Uh, right? We lived in a, I was born Where were you? Coppercliff, Ontario. And it was well named because we had big stone cliffs that went straight up behind the house. And this was quite a, a challenge for a young boy and I suppose I was about maybe 10 years old, something like that. And another a friend of mine, I decided it would be fun to climb one of those cliffs. And so we got climbing that cliff one afternoon. And we're way up and it's straight down. And we figured we saw a big crack that we could go along and then another crack. And we figured, well, if we just work this way and then up this way and around this way, we'll have it made. And, but the problem was that the crack started getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we went along. Pretty soon we had to hang on with one hand and take our jogging shoes off. We were in bare feet so we could get a better hold on the cliff. And then we kept going along because we were too afraid to go back at that point. It was worse back, we thought, than going ahead. So we kept going along with bare feet and hanging on with our fingernails. Finally, we got to a place where we were totally stuck. We couldn't go back, we couldn't go forward, and we were just hanging on that cliff like two flies. And we didn't know how long we could hang there. Fortunately, somebody in town saw us stuck there and they called the fire department. And the fire department came along with a big fire truck and got the ladder and went up the cliff and saved two boys and that was another happy ending. <laughs> One short story. One short story? One short story? Okay.
Okay, one Aladdin. more short story. Aladdin. Aladdin. <laughs> Let's see, we should have one about daughter Jane. Yeah. 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 How about one for daughter Jane? Can anybody believe that that Jane was ever, your mother was ever about uh, a year and a half old? Yes. No? Yeah, you can. Yes. Yeah, oh. just barely. Yes. Well, when she was about a year and a half old, or maybe younger, I'm not sure, we used to live back in Connecticut at a beautiful little town called Westport. And we had a a beautiful lake right near the house. And every evening we'd go canoeing there. In fact, we went in a canoe race and Jane and I won a race one year in a big contest. And, but generally we'd just canoe and swim around in the evening. And this one evening, I was swimming and she was floating in a, in a uh, tube. Not a, just a regular tire tube, that kind of thing. And I wasn't paying too much attention. And I liked to swim underwater quite a bit at that time. So I was swimming underwater and came up and looked around and there was the tube, but no Jane. Um, so I thought, boy, we're in trouble. So I went swimming down underwater, and I had to go way down, and it was kind of dark down there. And here was Jane just sinking, sinking, sinking. She didn't know how to swim, and she wasn't worried at all. She thought this was part of the way things were. I swam up real close to her, about six inches from her face, to see what, she, what expression she had on her face. And she was looking quite happy, and she was smiling to see me coming along. <laughs> so I scooped her up and took her up to the top, and she thought that was all part of the normal swimming routine, and uh, everything worked out, and that was another happy ending. <laughs> So, the end of story time for today? Yeah. 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 We're all done? Yeah. Okay. No. Let's give Grandpa a big round of applause. Yeah! yeah. <laughs>